and you are going to learn a lot of very useful details and information about what you need to know when accepting payments online. So our agenda for today is applying for a merchant account, understanding risk and approval issues, interchange and credit card pricing models, security tools spotting and fighting fraud. fraud. Also, we will speak a little bit about PCI compliance as it applies to different methods of integration. And of course, we will have questions and answers se session at the end of our webinar. Today's webinar is going to take, uh, I think, an hour, maybe a little bit more, depends on your questions. And uh, for all questions, just email to alliance at xcard.com. We will pick the best questions and voice them to the speaker. And let me speak a little bit about our speaker today. This is David Goodale. He is CEO of merchantaccounts.ca. He is the founder of this company, and uh, this is the longest established merchant account provider who work in e-commerce industry, and particularly in the area of international multi-currency commerce. So David has worked with clients of all sizes from across the world to help them expand into foreign e-commerce markets, including Canada, United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, and Russia, and such countries such uh, as Japan and Singapore, and many other territories. And uh, well, I just want to let the speaker to speak today. So David, it, it's all yours now. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Alex. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to uh, come to the webinar today. So I'll start by talking a little bit about merchantaccounts.ca. As Alex said, we were the first folks here in Canada to really specialize exclusively in e-commerce transactions and more specifically in international and multi-currency e-commerce. And to do that, we work with quite a few different banks and processing platforms in a lot of different places, you know, Canada, the US, Europe, Australia, and so forth. But no, I don't want to talk too much about us. I, we have a lot to cover here. And um, I'm just going to jump straight into it. So let's load up the first slide here. So this presentation is about what you need to know to take payments online. And I thought the best thing to start with is a recap of what every e-commerce transaction is comprised of. And this is probably going to be a lot of recap for some folks, but also it's still relevant to cover. So every e-commerce transaction is made up of three components. The first component is the shopping cart software, which most likely everybody here knows because that's Xcart. But for clarity, the shopping cart software is the software that powers the little add to cart buttons on the website, and its job is to keep track of what folks want to purchase. It figures out how much tax somebody owes when an order is about to be processed, how much the shipping is going to cost when an order is going to be processed, and its real job it, at that point in the transaction flow is to get to the order grand total. At that point, the shopping cart job is done, and the second component of an e-commerce transaction kicks in, which is the payment gateway. The payment gateway is very much like a POS machine, you know, very much like a card reader that you would use at a gas station if you were going to buy some gas. It's just, it's just taking place on the web, so there's no physical box that you swipe your card through. So that so clear, X cart is going to say, hey, gateway, wake up. I have a transaction here for John Smith. Uh, can you let me know if he has enough money to pay for this $100 sale? The payment that gateway queries the card issuing bank via Visa or MasterCard and ultimately finds out if he has enough money. At that point, two things happen. The first is in the same way that XCart asked the gateway to process the card, the gateway responds back and says, hey, XCart, remember John Smith? I just approved that order and here's your approval code. And that way XCART knows to go ahead and do its order confirmation, update the database, and do any post-transaction processes that are necessary. But what also happens is the third and final component of an e-commerce transaction comes into play, which is the merchant account. When that credit card gets charged, although you may not think about it on a practical day-to-day -day basis, the money actually does get deposited somewhere into a merchant account, which is a bank account that exists solely to hold funds that are captured from a credit card sale. So that's e an e-commerce transaction in a nutshell. And with that understanding, folks are going to need a merchant account. So I'd like to speak uh, a fair bit about what to be aware of when applying for a merchant account. And it's quite funny because I get calls from prospective clients quite often, and the first thing they ask is, you know, what's the best rate you can give me? Which is a very logical question, and actually it's, the, it's probably the biggest concern. But merchants don't realize 
that the rate that you're quoted only matters one if you're approved and two if you actually get it. So we're going to find talk a little bit later about pricing models. For now though we're just going to explain why there actually is an application process at all. Because it's really common for folks to be a little bit hesitant, especially because some acquiring banks and processors ask for quite a pile of application documents during the application process. I've actually had folks say, well, I don't know why you think I'm going to jump through hoops. You should be happy to win my business at all. It's a very valid statement. What they don't understand is how risk works in the acquiring business. So Visa and MasterCard have a very simple policy. It's that if somebody pays for something with their credit card, they get it, period. And that's literally the end of the story. It's one of the core protections built into using a credit card. It's also how credit card processors can lose money when they process transactions on behalf of a merchant. Because if a card holder doesn't get what was promised, and if the merchant cannot or will not return the funds to the card holder, then the, processors, the processor has to. They're ultimately on the hook. And that's the reason why there's an application process, because banks and processors don't want to lose money. They only want to work with good, stable merchants. And for clarity, most of that risk comes from chargebacks. Everybody probably knows what a chargeback is, but we should still clarify it. A chargeback is a disputed transaction. That's where a cardholder has contacted their card issuing bank and said, you know, either this wasn't me that used my card, or the merchant didn't give me what was promised, or some sort of dispute. And the card issuing bank contacts the processor to forcibly reverse the charges for that transaction. So that's how, uh, th that's what a chargeback is. With the understanding, or high level understanding at least, of why you must apply, we can dig in a little bit more to the actual risk issues. And this is really important because if you're applying for a merchant account, you may or may not realize that your application may or may not be high risk. And there's sometimes things that you can do to strengthen the application or even tweak your business model to help achieve better terms of approval. And so we'll dig right into some of the major things that impact that risk. The first one being the transaction size. If you're a merchant selling coloring books for kids and markers and crayons online, and your average ticket is $20, it means that there's $20 of risk. And if something goes wrong, $20 is on the line. And really, it's not a lot of money. Then there could be another merchant that sells Rolexes, and their average ticket might be $20,000. And if there's a dispute, it's a heck of a lot more money on the line. So simply by virtue of how expensive the stuff that you sell is, it will impact your risk score. Also, and more importantly than the individual transaction size, is the sales volume itself. A company that processes $5,000 of sales per month, if they went out of business or everything went wrong and they got into disputes, major disputes with their customers, it's only $5,000 worth of transaction. If a company is processing $1 billion per month in credit card sales, it's obviously a lot more at risk, and the underwriter is going to look into that file more closely. Next, I'm going to talk about future delivery, which is probably the least understood aspect in terms of why applications often get declined or need security reserves. So when you process something, there's a period of time that passes between when you process that sale and when the customer gets their stuff. And in general, and it's kind of logical common sense, the more time that, that passes between when you process the card and when it's done, you clap your hands and you walk away, the greater the risk score becomes. And I can use a very simple example that a lot of folks get surprised about, and that's a web hosting company. Because there's two typical models for web hosting. Either you bill your customers monthly, or you bill your customer annually. So for the web host that bills their customers annually, for example, if they do a big promotion and they have a thousand clients sign up on during the first month of this promotion and they all pay for 12 months of web hosting, and then for whatever unforeseeable reason they go out of business after the third month, well, the credit card processor is ultimately on the hook for all of that undeliverable web hosting. And this is where I reference this above about how you can tweak your business model. If you're able to push your customers to a shorter fulfillment duration or adjust some part of your business to make sure that you're billing your customers the majority of the payment closer to the date of the sale. For example, if you're a travel agency, you might charge a small deposit up front, the majority of the payment closer to the date of the booking. That's going to work a lot better and it's going to lower your risk score. Finally, 
the most important thing, or one of the most important things, perhaps it's obvious, is the product risk. Because some products are higher risk than others, which should be obvious. If you have a grandmother selling knitting books online to other grandmothers, that is not a high risk demographic. If you took an online video game, something like World of Warcraft, that uh, appeals to teenagers with, you know, a lot of free time on their hands and not really understanding what's right or wrong in the world yet, that's just simply a demographic that's going to have more, more associated with it. Now, if a merchant ha exceeds a certain percentage of chargebacks, they can get fined by Visa and MasterCard. So that's why the credit card processor is very um, weary to board merchants that sell products or services that traditionally or historically have had a significant number of disputes. And I'd love to go cover some examples of product service risk. There's obviously so many out there, I don't want to make examples. So if anybody in the webinar here has questions about their product or service, then you can ask a question in the question and answer session, and I would love to discuss it. But we'll just move on for now, and we're going to talk about submitting an application and the things that you can provide to strengthen or bolster your application. And the best, one of the best ones is the credit card processing history. Now, I realize that not all merchants have a credit card processing history. Some of them do. If you have, if you have credit card statements, you should always provide them for a couple of reasons. First of all, it shows the underwriter how much money you process typically. It shows them how often you do refunds and how much your refunds are. More importantly, it shows them how often you get chargebacks and how much your chargebacks total to. Because there's a lot of logical common sense behind all the policy. And realistically, if you've run business, if you've run cards for five years and never had more than half a percent of chargebacks in a given month, why would you jump to three or four or five percent chargebacks when you move to a new processor? And the real answer is you wouldn't. Secondly, you can leverage your processing history in another way, and it's to squeeze down the rates. Because if you have, if you're working with a potential processor and you're trying to negotiate a good rate for your business, providing the rate that you currently have creates an obvious target that your new processor will have to beat. Otherwise, there's no incentive for you to move over and board your business. Also, if you don't have, or sorry, if you don't want a security reserve, and we'll talk about security reserve in a moment, you're able to provide your statement to, again, demonstrate a reliable track record, which will uh, just give you a stronger leg to stand on when you're submitting that paperwork in. Processing history is good, but it's not the best. The strongest thing that you can do when submitting an application is demonstrate financial strength. At the end of the day, no bank or processor ever wants to lose money. And going back to, again to the fact that Visa and MasterCard have a simple policy, the cardholder has to get what they were promised or they get their money back. If your processor knows that you have the financial strength to weather any storm, then they're not going to be worried. And it means that you're, you're going to find a significantly reduced likelihood to have any type of security reserve on your account. And on this point, there are very many different profiles for a business. For example, that doesn't mean that a startup company is a huge risk. You know, I'm very, anybody in the business is well aware of the fact that most startups don't have bags of cash sitting around that they're just, you know, available to them at any time. So you don't have to be worried if your company is not tremendously financially strong. But you should always include a balance sheet, a profit and loss statement, and notes from your accountant, assuming you've had at least one year end. And if you haven't had a year end, include an opening balance sheet. And that opening balance sheet, a lot of folks think, well, gee, you know, I don't have a lot of assets, right? But online merchants, take for example, X car merchants, you've spent time setting up your store, you might have hired a designer or, or someone to modify the cart. You probably have inventory of the stuff that you're selling. There are a lot of intangibles in this business that absolutely have value, and they can absolutely be and should be reflected on the balance sheet. Finally, if you're a young company and there are some significant investors attached to your project, throw it in there. You should absolutely mention it because anything that adds credibility to your file should be demonstrated to the underwriter at your selected bank or processor. Last on the uh, issue, things that you can provide is the cover letter. I call it the secret weapon, and it's funny because there are not very many processors at all that make a cover letter a default part of the application. And it's surprising to me because the underwriter is going to sit there and he's going to have numbers 
he'll Google your company. He might do a credit check. Well, actually, he will do a credit check on the owners. He'll find out if there are any complaints, any awards. So he will do his due diligence, but at that point, the numbers are talking. And wouldn't it be better for you to paint your application in, in, in a desirable light, the light that you want it to be seen in? So you should, unless your application is very low risk, moderate trading volumes with a household good, I always suggest take the time to put together a cover letter and go about it very strategically. You should now have a little bit of an understanding of some of the things the underwriter is going to be concerned about, chargebacks, future delivery, the number of refunds, what you sell. What you're really doing in that cover letter is you're preemptively addressing every concern that you can think that the underwriter, right, that underwriter might have before he can actually have it. Never let it sink in. But you also don't want to be too flowery. You don't want to talk about you know, your high school track record and, and everything that's great and wonderful about you. You want to be really brief. I figure you have about, depending on the underwriter, but certainly not more than a minute or so of his attention or he'll just skim it or he won't read it. So never more than a page unless it's a particularly high volume business, you know, millions and millions of dollars per month. Outside of that umbrella, a couple paragraphs and be really accurate. Don't don't over promise on something because if it comes up that it's not true, you will lose all of your credibility and you'll end up shooting yourself more in the foot than you would have been if you didn't provide it at all. And perhaps most importantly is talk about your expertise in your industry and anything that sets you apart. I'll reference an example. I was working with a startup airline last year. Airlines, if you think about it, have tremendous future delivery and huge ticket sizes and so much money going through. Startup airlines are about the highest risk type of accounts you can get, period. And what happened is those owners came from WestJet, which if you're not familiar with them, are a very successful and large Canadian airline. So we built a cover letter together that highlighted the expertise of the board of directors and the management behind the company. They still had a security reserve and it was not a walk in the park, but we got them through. So the cover letter is really important and you should have hopefully an account manager at your, uh, at your chosen processor that you can work with to help structure that cover letter. If your application is really low risk and really low volumes, none of this may come up. But if you have established volumes, if you have any sort of future delivery, if this hasn't come up and if your chosen processor have, has not brought this stuff up, it might be a sign that they're just going to get you to pay, do the paperwork and send it in and hope for the best, which technically speaking, there's nothing wrong with it. It's probably standard in terms of how it's typically done in the industry, but I always figure if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. And so if you observe these uh, suggestions, you will get a better result. And unfortunately, there are going to be times when, despite your best efforts, and you know you might be the best writer in the world and have the most compelling story, but what if the application is just too high risk? It does happen. What happens is the underwriter uh, will often want to approve an account, but they just can't. For example, again, um, you could have a, a product that has too much feature delivery, or the company's too young and you just sell a really expensive product, or, or whatever it may be. What happens if he wants to approve it, or he or she, I should say, but what happens if they want to approve it, but they're not allowed to? Well, they will offer a conditional approval. There are many different conditions that can be put on a merchant account approval. The most obvious one is an upfront deposit. So a merchant might process $200,000 per month in sales, as an example. And the underwriter might decide that, well, they want to have collateral equal to $50,000, you know, so they're, they're one quarter secured against the, the risk on this account. Well, an easy way to do that is just to ask for the money. Hey, guys, will you give us $50,000 for, for upfront collateral? That works, for, that works actually very well for long-established businesses because you can secure that uh, collateral with a letter of credit from your bank and, an, and earn interest on it. But for most small and mid-sized merchants, that's really not ideal, especially for young businesses, because any upfront collateral at all could do a lot more good in an AdWords campaign or, or something to drive more customers to your website. So let's move on then to the tool here, which is very similar to the upfront deposit. The difference is that the build to reserve, you don't actually pay anything upfront. Let's use my $50,000 example. The underwriter wants $50,000 in collateral but they let you just start processing. You don't pay anything. They will just hold on to the first $50,000 that you processed. And once you hit the $50,000 mark, they'll, co they'll communicate with you and say, okay, you filled up your reserve. From this point forward, it's business as normal. 
and then you can renegotiate that reserve away as the business matures, and we'll talk about that in a couple of moments. The drawback of the build to reserve, especially for young businesses, is that the volumes can really ramp up. So you might project for what you might project whatever number, ten thousand dollars per month in credit card sales. So the underwriter might request a build to reserve equal to again whatever he decides, half collateral, a quarter collateral. The problem is that what if the build to reserve is not enough because your trading volume has really increased? It's not proportional. And that's why rolling reserves are most often used. That's what we'll talk about next. The rolling reserve is where the bank will pay you most of your money now, some of your money later. I'll give you an example. A 10% six-month rolling reserve means that when you do a transaction today, they give you 90% of your money right away, business as normal. They hold on to that last 10% for, in this example that I've made up, for a period of 90 or sorry, of six months. So actually, I'm just going to take a moment here. Can, it, can everybody hear me OK? I'm going to just check the, the chat window here and make sure everyone can hear me OK. I'm just going to adjust the audio. Um, I think, David, you need to disable echo cancellation. That can, uh, can you hear me OK? Can you hear me OK now? Yes, it's, it's very good now. OK, it's just the, the audio, for whatever reason, um, quieted down. Alex, can you re-maximize the, the slide there, please? OK, doing it. So what about now? Can everyone hear me OK? Yes, it, it works just fine for me. And I see in the chat window, everybody says, yeah, everything's perfect. fine. I think we should keep it right right as it is now. OK, perfect. Uh, can so you re-maximize that window? Back the, Thanks, Alex. Yeah, sure. Here it is. You can continue now. Thanks. Perfect. OK. Where do we leave off? So in terms of the, uh, yes. The advantage to the rolling reserve is it's proportionate because it doesn't matter how much volume you process or don't process. If they're holding 10%, it's 10% of whatever you did. Now, nobody likes reserve or a deposit or a build to or any types of conditions whatsoever because ultimately you want your money. And that's where sometimes you need to strategize. So as your business matures, as you process, the you know your risk profile changes. So you can ask for a review. I always recommend to folks ask for the review after six months of processing. Technically speaking, you can ask for the review on day two. You just really won't get anything done. The minimum amount of time that can pass before anything in my experience will be adjusted is usually three months. Six months is great, and a year is absolutely an important milestone. And you can't, and so there's actually two strategies you should really have. First of all, if you have a reserve, you should be bringing it down uh, after six months to a year, as long as you know your chargebacks aren't out of control. If, if the company's in worse financial shape with more chargebacks, don't ask for a reserve because you don't want them to even look at it. But assuming things are going well, you should bring it up. You can also bring up rates because at some point, hopefully, a business is going to grow and they've been with them for a while. So after a year, not only, when you're, not only should you be bringing up a reserve if there is one, you should be renegotiating your rates. Uh, and if you work with a good processor and they value your business, usually they will flex on that unless you're at like a floor limit where they just it doesn't make logical sense to go below. So I think that covers off a lot of the risk and approval questions. Again, I just want to reiterate, if anyone has any questions about risk or approval, let's Ask him the question and answer session because I'd love to help um, with some of those with some of those questions. At this point, though, it's time to start talking about pricing. Uh, pricing is something that used to be really simple in the industry, and over time has evolved to become more complex. It has to do, first of all, to become educated. You really should know what interchange is. So every merchant is very aware that when you process a credit card transaction, your processor will charge you a percentage-based fee. What you may not know is that the processor does not get to keep all of that fee. In fact, most often they don't get to keep most of that fee. So in other words, they get a cost. They have a cost that's charged to them by Visa and MasterCard. So when I use the term interchange, what I'm doing is I'm describing 
the industry term that literally means cost from the card schemes to the processor, Visa and MasterCard to the processor. Now, in terms of interchange, it's set up by region. Canada is a region, the US is a region, Europe is a region, Asia Pacific, and so on and so forth. So for every credit card processor within that region, the cost is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter who you work with, it's really a fair and even playing field, at least in terms of what rate they could provide to you. However, between regions, it does, uh, it really does vary. Australia has among the lowest interchange in the world. Europe also has very inexpensive interchange. Canada has moderate interchange, and the U.S. has a very complex interchange with many, many different card types. So if you have an international structure to your business, um, bringing in scope of what countries your business is domiciled in can help you set up your credit card process and t to take advantage of the lowest rates within each region. Now, the last note on interchange, and I'm, we're going to actually have a slide coming up in a moment here that, this, that actually shows the costs to give some reference on what the actual interchange charges are. But for now, to make an immediate point, I just need to, to state that in Canada, cost on an e-commerce transaction for a basic Visa card is 1.65%. The reason I'm mentioning that is every drop, scrap, and penny of that 1.65% goes to the card issuing bank. None of it goes to the processor, none of it goes to Visa. So it's really clear that the card issuer has their piece of the pie, but where are Visa and MasterCard? They're in the card brand fees. Uh, the card brand fees are very, very small. Currently in Canada, it's 0.08% for a Visa card and 0.077% for a MasterCard. So the actual card brand themselves, their fees are very, very reasonable. Uh, and again, the card brand fees may vary by region, but they should always be, always be very similar. Uh, lastly, there's something called presentment type. There are several presentment types. The most uh, obvious one is either card present or card not present. So whether the card is physically present or not and used with an electronic point of sale machine actually does impact the cost of the processor. Although it's a misnomer to imply that e-commerce transactions are significantly more expensive and, and most merchants do think that e-commerce transactions are significantly more expensive. They are not. In Canada, cost on a basic Visa card in point of sale transaction is 1.54% on an e-commerce transaction, as I mentioned, is 1.65%. So it's an only a difference of 11 basis points, or 0.11%. And that really does come into play, though, when we get into pricing models, which we're going to do in just one moment. Lastly, I want to mention that the type of card used also impacts the interchange rate. For example, a basic card costs less than a rewards card. A corporate card costs more than a rewards card. So really, there, there are quite, and, and the number of breakdowns depends on the territory. In Canada, we don't have as many different card types as there are in the United States. But it's beyond the scope of this presentation to get really into card type specifics. But in general, just remember rewards cards cost more than basic cards, usually 0.2 to 0.3% more. At this point, I would like to get into pricing models for a moment. And this is actually one of the more important discussions uh, in this presentation. You can see that I've written what is a qualified or a non-qualified One of three popular pricing models, qualified and non-qualified. I'm going to cover that second, though. The first model is very simple. It's flat pricing. Flat pricing is as simple as it sounds. You might have a rate, for example, of 3%. If your customer uses a corporate card, it doesn't matter. If the card's present or not present, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the processor absorbs any fluctuations at all that and, and the merchant pays the same rate. The benefit to that, the huge benefit to that is simplicity. Uh, it makes reconciliation easier. You don't have to wonder if you're getting a good deal or not. The drawback with it is this. As a processor, if I have a merchant, if I have a sizable merchant that comes to me and says, you know, we really prefer flat rates, I have to be very careful because what if this merchant processes premium and corporate cards all day long? We could misquote it. So in general, flat pricing is usually more expensive than the other two models that I'm going to describe right now. 
So let's talk about qualified and non-qualified transactions. There's nothing inherently wrong with qualified and non-qualified pricing. It's totally legitimate. The problem is that it can be vague and misleading. And there are a lot of really well-respected processors that have for years offered qualified and non-qualified pricing with a stable of super happy merchants. The problem is that the credit card industry has some less scrupulous processors that use qualified and non-qualified pricing to mislead merchants. And it makes them think that they have a lower rate than they really do. And I'm going to use an example of one right now and how it worked. It was, it was somewhere between a year or two years ago. I had a prospective client that came to me with a quote of 1.49%, and they wanted me to beat it. And they didn't want any backstory. They didn't want to be educated about interchange. They simply wanted to know, listen, 1.49%, don't give me a song and dance. Can you beat it or not? And I said, absolutely not. It was obvious. It should, well, I mean, with an understanding of interchange, it should be obvious. Cost in the best case scenario is 1.65%. So how were they getting 1.49? Well, if you look on their Schedule A of charges, they had a qualified rate of 1.49%, a mid-qualified rate of 1.49%, and a non-qualified rate of 1.49%. And as a merchant, you just want to run down the street and give everyone high fives. You think you have the best rate in the world. The problem is this, they really would pay 1.49% every time that they swipe the card, which as an e-commerce merchant, oh, I'm just going to adjust, I see I got a message here that the volume is quiet again, I'm just going to adjust it here. Can everyone hear me again? Yeah, it's good. Okay, okay. How long was I out there, Alex? Sorry? How long was it down for? Well, maybe for two or five minutes, something like that. It it, it just came down all of a sudden. Okay, okay. I'll just I'll just watch here to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, we're sorry, guys, for that, but it's you know it's internet. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think we you... just yeah sure. I'm doing it right now. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Thank did you, you want me to back up a bit, or did you want me to just move forward? Uh, well, just move forward. Okay. I was talking about qualified and non-qualified pricing, and uh, and I was referring to an example of a merchant that got a quote of 1.49%, which was miles below cost to the processor. The problem was this. They really would pay 1.49% every time a card was swiped. How often do X-Cart merchants swipe? Never. But it would never stop an unscrupulous processor from quoting that way. So what happens is every time they didn't swipe, which was all the time, they got hit by the mid-qualified fee of 1.49%. But it wasn't 1.49%, it was an additional 1.49%. And then if it was a rewards card, it became non-qualified for an additional 1.49%. So this merchant that thought they were going to pay 1.9% was actually paying you know, closer to 4.5%. And it's still not done, because most processors will pass through the fluctuations in interchange. So I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the cost difference between a basic card and a rewards card is 11, or sorry, a, a swiped card and an e-commerce card is 11 basis points. So that would get added on. And then the cost difference between a basic card and a rewards card is usually in Canada 20 basis points. So you'd still add an, on another 31 points. So this merchant was sitting or would be sitting somewhere around 4.8% per transaction potentially but they thought they were getting 1.49. And that's why I have a real beef with uh, qualified and non-qualified pricing. There's nothing wrong with it, but it can be used to provide a misleading quote. So the issue was this. What can you do if qualified is pricing is misleading and flat pricing is, is not as competitive as a, as a variable rate? Well, there's a third model. It's the best model. It's a model that's fairly rare, usually only appreciated by very large merchants, uh, rarely offered to small merchants. But it's called interchange plus pricing. And it's becoming more popular. And that's a good thing. That's where the prospective processor will just tell the merchant what rate that they're, or sorry, what margin they'll put on their transactions. So for example, you might get a quote of interchange plus half a percent. And you, any given moment, you don't know if someone's going to use a rewards card. The cost when you look at your statement will fluctuate all over the place. 
But the one thing you'll absolutely know is you're paying 0.5% over cost. And the whole idea is if you can go to bed at night and live with whatever margin your processor has quoted, then you have transparency and you have controls and you can feel good about it. So next slide here, which I'm about to load, you will see a breakdown of the interchange listing. This is a listing of Canadian interchange uh, from a few months ago. The blue column are for Visa cards. The orange column is for MasterCard. Now, if you're looking at the electronic row, you may be thinking that's electronic commerce, which is perfectly logical. It's what I thought, of course, when I saw it for the first time, and it's wrong. It's for electronic point of sale. E-commerce transactions actually qualify at the standard level. So in Canada, it's 1.5 for basic Visa, 1.85 for a rewards Visa, like a points card or an air miles card, and 2% for a corporate Visa. MasterCard is 1.72. Rewards MasterCards are 2.13. And I think there might be a typo on this because corporate MasterCard is actually 2%. Now, there are other card types. There are super premium cards that have an interchange rate higher. They can be 2.65% or even more. I mention it for the sake of, of being thorough, but it's not something that merchants should bring into a statistical analysis because super premium cards are statistically very, very rare. So when you're trying to figure out, well, how much is my processing going to cost to me, you don't generally want to be paying attention too much to the super premium cards. There's just not very many of them. Interchange is updated, usually in Canada, it's usually updated every April. It's not updated in any significant way. Uh, the last time they actually brought out the super premium Visa card in the last uh, revision. But it will never change very significantly. And another important point to mention is if interchange ever is adjusted downwards, which can certainly happen, being on interchange plus pricing will mean that that cost savings is automatically passed on to you. And I guarantee if you're on flat pricing or qualified and non-qualified pricing, your processor is not going to email you to let you know that their cost went down. Interchange plus really is a really good way to go. So in terms of pricing, there are cross-border considerations. Now, when I say cross-border, what I'm referring to is your business will be domiciled in a particular country and you will sell to customers most likely in your country and outside of your country. What I'm referring to is when you sell to a customer located outside of your country. I'm going to use the example of Canada just because it's the example that I deal with all the time. So in Canada, we sell into the US all the time. If we sell to an American cardholder in Canadian dollars, so we actually bill them in Canadian currency, Visa and MasterCard will assess a 0.4% cross-border surcharge to the processor. That's what they charge to the processor. And that processor is almost certainly going to pass it on to you, the merchant, unless you're on some type of flat pricing model. Now, if I set a merchant account up in US currency, it actually Im impacts the cross-border fee. If I were to charge a US cardholder in US dollars, the cross-border fee increases to 0.8%, which is actually fairly expensive. And a lot of merchants might think, well, then it's actually to my detriment to bill in my customer's local currency, but it's not. For example, the, the, the benefit in this example of billing in US dollars is it lets us settle money back from our customers still in US dollars. It avoids any FX charges and gives us usable US money. So for example, we do AdWords with Google, our server with Rackspace, we have charges in US dollars. So there are reasons to bill customers in their local currency. It's almost always better to bill a customer in their local currency, but you will pay more on the cross-border fee when doing that. Now, there are also impacts not just to the merchant when you're selling across borders, there are impacts to the cardholders themselves. The first one is well, the obvious one is if you bill your, your customer in a foreign currency, their card issuer will charge them an exchange rate. That one, I think, is obvious. Everyone's probably used to that. But there are other impacts as well. Going back to my example, of uh, you might have a Canadian merchant selling to an American cardholder in US dollars. So for clarity, this US cardholder is paying a native currency. When that cardholder completes the purchase, their card issuing bank may still surcharge them even though it was in their domestic currency. Now, this is a little bit of a point of contention, certainly with, with uh, Canadian merchants and probably other international merchants as well. Because 
And I'm not on the issuing side of the business, so I can't really address this to any authoritative degree. But if you build the customer in their local currency, why is the card issuer adding a surcharge? And it's not just a surcharge. It's actually a separate second line item on the customer's credit card statement equal to 3% of the ticket size. So if, if you sold to an American cardholder, their card issuing bank, if they did this, would charge a $30, if it was $1,000 US, they might charge them a $30 separate second line item fee. And the frustrating part about it is it will have the merchant's name beside that charge. But the merchant and the merchant's processor is not the one causing it or earning the fees, it's all the card issuing bank. If this is a complaint that you've ever had and have never really known how to deal with before because you didn't really understand it, you can address it quite authoritatively. You can tell that customer you should be upset and you should contact your card issuing bank because they're the ones that charge that fee, they're the ones that earn the fee. And there used to be a lot of complaints about this when it first started, which feels like about two years ago now, maybe three years ago. I think a lot of folks have gotten more used to the fact that it happens, so the, the complaints are very rare that comes up now. And also for clarity, it is absolutely not every card issuing bank. It's, it's only some issuing banks. So it's simply something to be aware of when you are selling across borders. There is a second and far less you know, likely issue to come up, but I just want to mention it for the sake of being thorough. Card issuing banks have anti-fraud, just like merchants do. For example, my grandmother, I guarantee you, has never bought anything online, nor will she ever. And if she tried to buy something online, it would absolutely be outside of her buying profile and the bank would most likely, her card issuing bank would decline, um, would decline that transaction when they saw the interchange was clearing at a card not present at the standard interchange level. But it can also happen for other reasons. So for example, if you have a customer, if, if you're selling to a customer in a foreign country and that customer has never purchased outside of their country before, the card issuing bank could put a block on that transaction and cause a decline. And it does happen from time to time. It's not really a huge problem because all that customer does is they call their bank and say, hey guys, are you blocking my transaction? Because I'd really like to buy this thing. Can you let it go? And they will certainly do it. And then the transaction can go through. And it statistically does not happen with any big degree. I just am really mentioning it for the sake of being thorough. So in terms of pricing, we've covered the pricing models and we've covered qualified and non-qualified. How can you really get to the bottom line? Because if you're an online merchant and if you've ever looked at the statement that's sent to you by your processor, if you were confused, you are in the majority of people. In fact, you would be shocked. You'd actually probably really be shocked how many people get their statement and they could process for a year or two years and never, not even one time, break down the rate that they were paying because it just looks too confusing. And there's a way to cut through the clutter. It's called the effective merchant discount rate. It's, uh, it, and actually in Canada, uh, credit card processors legally have to disclose the EMDR now because it, it prevents, it's a way for merchants to not think they're paying one point whatever and really be paying three point whatever or something like that. Now calculating EMDR is really easy. All you do is you take a given month. You could take, uh, you could take last month. You could take September, pull out your statement and look at how much money you processed. Also look at how much money processor kept back from you, the total fees that they charged. All you do is you divide your fees into the total amount of money that you processed and times the result by 100. That will give you your effective merchant discount rate. If you want to be really particular about it, you can subtract off the monthly fee and subtract off uh, any other incidental charges that may have been on that statement. But Regardless, it, the EMDR is not meant to be laser accurate. It's meant to give you an accurate point of reference because if you think you have a rate of 2.5 and you look at your EMDR and you're paying 3.7, well, then you know you're not getting what you thought. It's a really good way to keep in control of your costs. So I think that covers off merchant account pricing. And I want to move on forward here and talk a little bit about fighting fraud. Fraud is really, uh, it's not something that merchants have to be afraid of because there are a lot of tools available at your disposal, but you can't go in blind. Really, and when I talk about fraud, I'm talking about avoiding chargebacks. And the first thing that I should point out is not all chargebacks are fraud. There are actually a lot of cases of, 
of friendly chargebacks where somebody has bought something, a month has gone by and they looked at their statement descriptor and they just didn't remember buying it. But that's much more likely to happen if your descriptor doesn't accurately, accurately reflect, reflect your company. So if you have a numbered corporation, you do not want your first statement to say 10325 Incorporated Inc. You know, you want it to say John's T-shirts.com. And if the customer recognizes the transaction, they're not going to dispute it. Also, good customer service is really important, obviously beyond the scope of just avoiding chargebacks. But when a dispute happens, uh, or, or, or a dispute, but you have to remember that with credit card processing, the cardholder can always go to their current issuing bank. And if you have a customer that's really ticked off, you can't, you can't put them in that bind where you just leave it unresolved. It's always better to open a discussion and usually better to do a refund if you know that a chargeback is going to occur. Because the card issuing bank's first responsibility, generally speaking, is always to the cardholder, not to the merchant. And you have an uphill battle to win any dispute that happens. So just in general, avoid chargebacks. Don't let it get that far. Similarly, don't overpromise on your goods. Make sure you're accurately describing what you're selling. I'll give you an example. I bought a solar light, and it was supposed to be this amazing solar light that could light up the walkway at my home. And when I got had about the light of a candle, I, you know, I, I didn't charge it back, but I absolutely could have. So it's really important that you accurately reflect what you're selling on your website. But let's not talk about little friendly things. Let's talk about actual fraud. What do you do? Well, the first thing is spotting fraud. There are a lot of anti-fraud tools out there. Merchants are probably familiar with them already. But I've always been a very strong believer there is no anti-fraud tool that is good as your gut. And as funny as that sounds, I, I totally believe it. Because you can scan an order and you can look at things. You can look, for example, if someone's name is spelled wrong, um, if the phone number is missing a digit, or the area code is not there. Or I hope there are no fraudsters listening to this because this is a, a, a secret that I don't know if a lot of people know. For whatever reason, fraudsters often do their orders all in uppercase. Why they do that, I have absolutely no idea, but I swear it is absolutely true. So the point is, you can see things and it just doesn't look right. Or it could even be, it's not even that, it could just be a Gmail or a Hotmail address, you know, a web-based address that you're not feeling good about. So when you have doubt, when you, when you have any doubt, pick up the phone. Because what you can do is you can call your customer. You can say, you know, hi, John, it's, it's merchant calling from this store. For our security, as well as your own as a cardholder, we always call to make sure that this was an authorized use of your card. Was it? And then you can ask them some questions. Can you let me know? Can you confirm your billing address? Can you confirm your shipping address? This goes a long way because, first of all, most fraudsters aren't going to have the billing address of the stolen credit card memorized. For that matter, most fraudsters aren't going to give a working phone number. Does doing a phone number go all the way, does it 100% eliminate the possibility of fraud? No. No, it absolutely does not, but it goes nine-tenths of the way. There are also other tools there. For example, address verification. The acronym for that is AVS, that which compares the customer's billing address on file to the address submitted with the order. It's worth noting that, so you may or may not know this, AVS only hits on the numerical. It does not... Uh, it does not compare the alpha characters. It's really just looking at the numerics of the address. CVV is another uh, security protocol. It's a three-digit code on the back of the card. CVV is pretty secure because by P by the within the scope of PCI compliance that we'll talk about in a moment, you absolutely cannot ever store CVV ever anywhere. So if you have a CVV match, it's a really good indicator that it's, uh, that it's a legitimate order. Now, if there was one masterful tool that could be better than any other. It's verified by Visa and MasterCard secure code. So verified by Visa occurs if, if you're purchasing online and you type in the credit card number and you hit the submit button and you think it's done, all of a sudden you're presented with a pop-up box. That pop-up box is delivered by the card issuing bank. The, the card issuing bank will basically ask, you know, cardholder, can you please enter your password? If they don't enter that password, they cannot proceed with the purchase. Now, it's really great from the perspective that if somebody enters their verified by Visa or secure code password, they absolutely cannot claim that the transaction was not them. 
in, it, the actual it, the liability shifts away from the default to the cardholder's protection to the merchant's protection. But historically, there was a real problem with it. The problem was click-offs. Verified by Visa and Master, MasterCard Secure Code, I don't, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but they had a huge amount of click-offs because some folks didn't want to register for it. Some people didn't remember their 3D their verified by Visa password, and it would result in cart abandonment. And I was at a presentation by Visa a couple months ago, and they have actually finally addressed this in, in a really positive way. In fact, it's a really positive way. They've moved to an algorithmic-based uh, logic that's run by the card issuer. So when you do verified by Visa transactions now, your customers are not going to be challenged by default. They will only be challenged if something suspicious is happening on the order. I think the statistic that they were hoping for was about 10% challenges or less, which is really great. Now, the most important part of it is this, though. Even if the customer's not challenged, you're still protected under, under verified by Visa. So your click-offs are not likely to be st specific, they're not likely to be any higher than they are today, not statistically significantly. And the liability is shifted to the card issuing bank. And uh, I figure uh, as a merchant, if you can shift the liability away from yourself to the card issuing bank, well then absolutely, why wouldn't you? That's not to say that I think you should use it all the time because you don't, you shouldn't. If you have a low risk product, repeat customers and fraud's just not an issue for you then you probably don't need to enable it, but it really is a good service. Finally, the last little note there is don't charge customers until the product or service is fulfilled. For clarity, what this is referring to is pre-authorizations. A pre-authorization is where you bill a card today, but you don't actually get the money. So I could, I could charge my card for, say, $1,000, and I could pre-authorize it. Now, that $1,000 is taken off my card and put in limbo. I can't spend it, it's absolutely locked up, but I also can't see it on my statement, it's not showing up. It's locked up for five days. And during that time, as a merchant, I can go in and hit the capture button. It's not until I hit the capture button that I actually suck the funds off the card, and it's not until I hit the capture button that I'm actually exposed to chargeback risk. So as a merchant, in general, you should be pre-authorizing your orders by default because it does a couple things. It lets you screen for fraud before you've even captured the card. And more importantly, you don't, your credit card processor does not incur interchange fees until the payment is captured. It means that as a merchant, if you have a good agreement, you should not be paying any discount rate charges until you capture. So all those fraudulent orders that you don't actually want to process, you don't have to pay for anymore. I also want to talk a little bit about international fraud. You know, and there are some territories that have a significantly much higher incidence of fraud than others. Um, you know, it's and it all, it's almost obvious if your ship, if you get an order from a third world country with a developing infrastructure, and the authorities there just do not have the resource to ca to crack down on fraud, you absolutely should be screening that order more carefully. Now, that's not to say that orders from, from some of these territories are not valid, and, and, that's, and I'm not meaning to imply that you shouldn't ship to those countries, but, what you, but as a merchant, it's your responsibility to make sure that the order is ultimately legitimate, and what you could do is you could call them. You could even go further. You could say that, for example, you want a copy of a photo ID just so that you can see that the photo ID matches the name on the card. What you're ideally trying to do is make it hard enough that fraudsters are just going to give up, but not quite hard enough that you'll tick off a real customer, you know, and cause them to abandon the order. And uh, there are a, a lot of different ways to, to do this, but just by using your common sense and some of the tactics that we mentioned above, you can go a long way towards cutting that down. As a last little note, ABS is work internationally. So a foreign, if an ABS result doesn't match, even sometimes on domestic orders. Uh, David, I'm sorry, but it's again something with with sound. Can you please play with settings a little bit? Is that better? Yes, it's better now. Okay, sorry, Alex. How long was it down for? Just for 30 seconds. Seconds. Okay. I just decided to interrupt you. Okay. Sorry, guys, yeah, about that. That's okay. Just please interrupt, please Alex. Don't. Yeah, okay. So, so I'm yeah, just going to sure. recap. 
AVS there, AVS does not always work with, with foreign, foreign credit cards. It also doesn't even always work with domestic cards. So if you see an AVS mismatch, don't be scared, like particularly scared on the order. It just means look into, a little, look into it a little bit more closely. Even for domestic orders, sometimes it mismatches and it can still be a legitimate order. I also wanted to address a little bit about the difference between aggregators and merchant account providers. Uh, an example of a really popular uh, aggregator is PayPal. The difference between a merchant account provider and an aggregator is an aggregator uses one merchant account, their own merchant account, to process transactions on behalf of many different merchants. And you know, in terms of which is better, an aggregator or a merchant account provider, really there is no real answer to that question because they both have huge advantages in their own way. Um, the obvious, take PayPal for example. PayPal really is an awesome service and I'm not just saying that on the webinar. I tell it to all my clients because it has no setup fees. It lets you get up and going instantly. Um, th there are, in fact, to be honest, for a small merchant, it's the, easy, it's the path of least resistance. Um, but there's a flip side to it that merchants don't understand. Anytime a merchant account provider issues a merchant account, they have to undertake all these uh, steps One's called a KYC, I know your customer check. You know, and we have to basically make sure that we're not sending money to terrorist groups and you know, or, or, or a company that's going to just process a bunch of cards and disappear and, and that nobody's stolen someone else's identity. And the difference is that an aggregator by virtue of their business model has no barrier to entry. Because they have no barrier to entry, they have a lot of accounts signing up. And in fact, I'm going to talk about PayPal for a second. One complaint that I hear quite often um, about PayPal is that accounts get shut down and frozen. And it's actually not a valid complaint. It's just that merchants don't understand the difference between an aggregator and a merchant account provider. All of those KYC and know your customer checks and the due diligence just has to be done. The difference is that a merchant account provider does it up front. Uh, an aggregator may do it later on. Like, an, first of all, an aggregator, aggregator may never do that. But if the volumes go flying up or if there's chargebacks or something like that, it may cause a flag or a trigger to cause the account to need to be reviewed. And it may be necessary for that account to be put on hold while that review happens, which may happen midstream during a really busy month. So really, the, there are pluses and minuses on both sides of the coin. And it's just a matter for the merchant to understand the difference between them and, uh, and make sure that they make an educated decision with whatever they do. I'd also like to talk about payment card industry compliance, uh, which is a security standard. So PCI, when, first of all, when e-commerce was really first created as a concept and nobody was really using it yet, there was no real established security protocol. It was kind of the, the Wild West days. Um, and then at first there were some uh, pro standards that were created and they were different. MasterCard had its security standard, Visa had its security standard, they weren't the same diners. And every different card had its own security standard and it was broken. So a new standard was formed called Payment, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. It's a series of security guidelines and policies that a merchant has to adhere to when they're going to touch credit cards. In terms of who needs to be PCI compliant, any and every business that touches, handles, or stores credit card information in any way at all whatsoever. And it's really important, even if you're just keying a credit card number into a virtual terminal, even if you don't store a credit card number anywhere, if you touch it for a second, it still pulls you into the scope of PCI compliance. So as a merchant, don't kid yourself into thinking you don't need to be compliant because you're not storing credit cards. You still need to be compliant. But I'd like to talk a little bit more about PCI compliance specifically in relation to X-Card merchants. There are four levels of PCI compliance. The, tier, the, the hardest level, tier one, is applicable to banks and processors. It involves an on-site audit and you know, just a tremendous amount uh, of inspection and, and so forth. Fortunately, that's not going to apply to X-Card merchants. Tier four is the easiest level to achieve. And it applies to any merchants processing up to 20,000 e-commerce transactions annually, which are going to be, you know, generally speaking, most X-Cart merchants. Well, what do you need to do in order to be a tier four merchant? Well, there are two components to PCI compliance. The first is a security scan. Visa and MasterCard, PCI Council, I guess I should say, maintains a list of ASVs, 
That's an acronym that stands for Approved Scanning Vendors. These are folks that are certified by by the by the PC accounts to undertake a scan of your web server to look for vulnerabilities or weaknesses. Really, it's a friendly hack. And what they do is they go in and do that scan and they might tell you your version of Apache is out of date or your PHP needs to be patched or any number of I'm sure they scan for thousands and thousands of things. The point is though that if they find any vulnerabilities at all whatsoever, you failed. But that's not a bad thing. In a way it's actually a good thing. Because what you do is they tell you what's wrong, you go back and you patch it and you rerun the scan. And you keep doing that until they can't find anything wrong. And that's good for three months. Tier 4 merchants have to undertake their scan quarterly. And the cost for that PCI scan, um, you know, it depends on the on the provider that you're using. I think uh, McAfee charges about $100, something in the range of $100 per year for scanning. It's really not a big cost. And it's even worth mentioning, even if a merchant literally never touched credit card data, for $99 a year for the scan, it's actually quite a good value. In addition to the technical side of this uh, of the security scan, there's also a self-assessment questionnaire. This is a questionnaire that a merchant must complete themselves, and it forces a merchant to have good and sensible policies as it applies to the handling of credit card data. Some of these questions are really obvious and really simple, like if you have credit card numbers written down, do you keep them in a secure location? Well, that question is pretty obvious. Do you change your system default passwords so they're not the so that they're not the default password. For example, your router or your firewall should not have the password admin for obvious reasons. So it forces you to do common sense things. It also has some fairly technically detailed questions such as does your server infrastructure have a DNS and do you refuse you know, any non-standard ports and do you have to explicitly allow in traffic. So it can be fairly, fairly challenging to get through. There are different versions of there. And if you're able to outsource the handling of the credit card information, you're able to complete an easier version of the SAQ. And I'm going to talk about that right now. What can you do to minimize the burden of PCI compliance? Because a lot of merchants quite genu genuinely would not want to deal with it at all. But you have a responsibility to. You have a responsibility to your cardholders. So what a lot of merchants end up doing is they implement a payments integration in which they do not touch any cardholder data. So if you think of the transaction flow in XCart, people are adding, let's use a shoe store, they're adding shoes to their webs to their cart, they click the checkout button, they, they type in their billing address, and they're all ready to go, but there's no actual credit card input field on the page, it's just a continue button. When the customer hits continue, they are redirected to the, the payment gateway, which is typically called a redirect method of integration. Now, a redirect integration can either be brutally intrusive and terrible or almost completely seamless. And it just depends on your paint gateway and whether your developers have rolled up their sleeves to tidy up that integration. But the customer hits the gateway, types in the credit card number, it gets approved, and then the users pass back to XCart with no credit card data attached to that order. In lieu of the credit card data, there's just an authorization code. And by doing that, you've, you've made it so that you can't touch the credit card number. Uh, now, there's also similarly another method as opposed to redirecting off-site. You can have the credit card number be hosted in an iframe or even there's a company called Hosted PCI. They literally just feed in the credit card field and the expiry date, which causes PCI to fall under their scope. But I guess the, the point that I'm making here is if you don't want to touch credit card data, you certainly don't have to. And it, if you do go that route of redirecting, it does not have to be intrusive. If you work with a good gateway, you should be able to make it quite, make it be quite seamless. Now, it is also worth noting, though, that um, your marketing folks may want to have uh, the, the payment take place on your website. PCI compliance is not something to be afraid of. It's not that it's unachievable. It's just that it's more work. And if you have technical folks and you are brand branding sensitive, as a rule of thumb, one click less to purchase is always better. So if you can have an on-site integration in general, it is better to do an on-site integration. I'd also like to talk a little bit about a different data security standard, which is PADSS. So PCI applies to merchants. PA 
stands for payment applications, and it applies to payment applications just like XCard. It's a series of compliance rules that were created by the card brands to make sure that shopping cards secure. XCard is a fully PA DSS uh, certified platform through its X payments module. And if you're not using XCart, you can even still take advantage of the X payments module to help your cart achieve compliance if it's not PA DSS certified. Now, just for the sake of being thorough, I want to mention that if you were a merchant and you built your own custom integration to the gateway, you don't need to worry about PA DSS. It's only if you're building a shopping cart to resell it to other parties that you fall inside the scope of PA DSS certification. So I think those are all of the topics that I had uh, wanted to cover over at a high level here. I know we bounced around a bit between risk and approval and rates and fraud and so forth. I'd like to, to open the floor up here to any questions and find out if there's anything that I could help folks with in terms of questions. Uh -huh, yes, and I just want to remind uh, our visitors that they can ask questions. They can ask actually David about their particular situation, about their products and about their business and that's what David said just maybe 20 or 30 minutes ago. And I believe we have a couple of questions that I'm going to voice. And uh, it's it just a small note from my side when you, David, said about regions where fraud transactions are originating from. And in our case, in case of X card, as, as we sell our software online and process credit cards, the most of fraud transactions originate for us from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, in our case, we can easily determine whether or not this transaction is a fraud from Vietnam because for some reason, guys from Vietnam prefer to use two letters in their email addresses, VN, which is their domain name. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I don't know why they do it all the time. It's like you said uh, about capitalized letters. Yeah, exactly. Vietnam, Vietnam fraudsters use those two letters in the email addresses, like you know, the, like they mark their territory or something like that. And it, it, but that that makes our job a little bit easier. <laughs> well, it absolutely does. That's why and I almost yes, like we, telling the the capital letter secret because I don't want fraudsters to start writing in properly in lowercase. But <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, and you, and you get really well, good at picking up on it too. And yes, and the, one of the questions is, uh, can we get a copy of the presentation? Well, I, I, I think I think we can share it if David don't doesn't mind. What about oh, you, David? Absolutely, I, I wouldn't mind that one bit. Okay, we will we will publish it through uh, our website. I mean, xcard.com website. Okay, here is a question: Is a merchant account the same as a business account? As I'm in the United Kingdom, I'm aware we use different terminology. So maybe it's about just terminology different in different countries. So your comments on that? Well, I think they might be referring to a business bank account. So a merchant account is not a bank account. And, and I certainly have clients in the UK. And yes, in the UK, you still need a merchant account. So the actual transaction flow works like this. The money comes off the customer's card and it immediately, like literally at the point of sale, gets deposited into your merchant account. And from that point, it's going to be funded out into your regular business bank account per the funding schedule of your processor. In the UK for e-commerce transactions, I find as a rule of thumb, funding is usually done weekly, whereas over in North America, funding is usually done daily. But the, but the actual funding schedule will be up to be between yourself and your, and your processor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, we need to wait maybe a minute or two to get other questions email from our attendees today. And yes, we've got another question about PCI compliance. So uh, let me let me let me read it for you. So if I only use PayPal standard payment, where user user will be entering credit card information on PayPal website, and I never see or touch the credit card numbers, do I have to become PCI compliant, or PayPal take care of that? Well, that's a really good question, um, and and it and, and I'm. I'm familiar with PayPal, but not all the different variations that they offer. But I'll give you uh, kind of a high-level answer to your question. So with PayPal, you might be thinking, for example, that you're redirecting to their website, so you're literally never touching any cards at all. 
But if you have a virtual terminal with PayPal and you're taking orders over the phone and keying them in manually, you're still touching the card. And even if not, if you're truly only redirecting to PayPal and, and never touching cardholder data at all ever, not even in a virtual terminal or phone-based transaction, it sounds like you may fall outside of the scope of PCI. And Alex, I actually know, because I listened to it yesterday, that you had a, a lady from McAfee with a full presentation on PCI, and I think she tackled exactly this question. So I'm actually going to defer to you. So my, my real answer is it sounds like you do fall outside of the scope, but I'm going to qualify that with that I'm not knowledgeable enough about pay, uh, PayPal's integration to really know. So reach out to PayPal or check that um, other webinar on XHeart's YouTube channel for that answer. Uh, yes, uh, as we have, uh, we had another webinar uh, almost a year ago with McAfee where the speaker was speaking a lot about different aspects of PCI compliance and uh, she, ca she, she said that even if your website doesn't touch credit card details, you can still touch them. Uh, for example, using, a, using if you accept phone owners, just what David just said. And in this case, you fall into PCI compliance anyways, because PCI compliance it actually, it involves maybe hundreds of different requirements depending on your level and how you process credit cards. Okay, David, I have one more question. Uh -huh. How do you deal with the situation where the pre-authorization was approved and the order was shipped on the basis of off code received from turning when turning the pre-off to an off? <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's a little bit hard for me to read that. And then after shipping the product and having signed receipt for the shipment, we still got a chargeback because the own was received after the pre-authorization expired. I hope uh, you understood what I just read. I think what you're saying, Alex, is that somebody got an order, they ran the pre-auth, they shipped yeah. it and they forgot to capture or they just didn't capture it in time and then they couldn't go ahead and bill that card again. I, th th I think that's... I think that's what they were saying. No, no, no. I think it's uh, they made pre-authorization and then mm -hmm. it was approved and they shipped the order and then they captured the fan, fun, funds. Yeah, they're saying about turning the pre-authorization to authorization. Mm -hmm. And they, after all of that, they still receive chargeback. Oh, I understand the question. So a pre auth okay, so once you capture it, you, you've captured it. I, I, so the advantage of a pre-authorization is it gives you the chance to screen the order and it avoids any discount rate or it should avoid any discount rate charges when you're doing it. So once you made the decision to ship that order and you captured it and it became a full authorization, at that point it's no different than if you had fully authorized it right from the first second of the transaction. <clears throat> so pre-authorizations don't protect you at like a technical level. They protect you from a common sense level. It gives you that window to screen your orders before you actually capture and decide to ship. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple more questions for you if you do not mind. Oh, no problem. So uh, Phil Richman, we are now capturing the transaction at the time of the sale. We have had a couple of fraud attempts in the past year or so. Only one of the attempts was actually shipped. Is there any benefit to pre-authorization for us rather than immediately capturing the charge? Huge benefit. It's the one that I just mentioned. If they switch to pre-auth, all of those orders that they didn't ship, they should not incur a discount rate for. Also, it, although it's unlikely, technically speaking, once you've fully authorized the, ch the charge, uh, or the card, a chargeback can happen. So let's say that it's a long weekend and like 5 p.m. on a Friday on a long weekend, the payment comes in and you've authorized it and maybe you're not going to look at it until Tuesday. Well, if that cardholder looks at the transaction Saturday, Sunday, or Monday and charges it back, um, you know, you, you can get charged back immediately once you've authorized. But if you had ran the pre-auth, it would have given you a window to one, avoid the fees, and two, literally prevent the chargeback from happening because it can't happen until they capture it. Okay, one more question from Phil and 
uh, you know, plumbingmall.com is their website. It sounds so familiar. I believe I met with the guys from this website in Chicago in June. So guys, feel if you know me personally, I'm saying hello to you and your guys because I believe I met with you in Chicago in June. Anyways, here's second question from Phil. Also, we have oftentimes that the customer initiates extra fees, such as lift gauge charges and etc. Is it okay or acceptable to overcharge on a pre-authorization in order, in order to make annulments for possible extra charges and then capture actual charges when the customer receives the item? So I believe this is related to the situation when, let's say, uh, a customer pays for some initial order and then uh, decided to add something else later. So what to do in this situation? Well, there's a couple of different ways to do that. What you're really talking about are overage charges. You know, and it could be, the, you know, for example, a, a phone company. You could be allotted this many minutes of long distance and use more than you said, so you owe more at the end of the month. I think the way that if I was developing an integration uh, myself in, with that type of business, I would set it up to process the appropriate amount for the original order. And I make it part of my terms and conditions that if you go over whatever, you know, whatever contractually you've agreed to, for example, a phone company, anything over 500 minutes a month is 25 cents a minute or whatever. So at the end of the month, when it happens, you would send an email to the customer like an invoice that would be an overage charge. And depending on your payment processor, you should hopefully be able to go into your control panel, find that customer's profile, and bill their card again. And this is where the functionality will range because some processors offer the functionality and others don't. But, but with us, we have customer accounts. So what you do is you turn that customer into an account. And at any time, you can go back to that customer's account in the gateway control panel and say, hey, for John's account, can you bill John another $25? And it, it creates a separate second transaction, which I think is a better way to do it than overcharging them on their card, which I don't know off the top of my head, but I feel like it's probably against the rule because you have to disclose to your customer how much you're billing their card and you can't charge more than you have contractually agreed just to create headroom in case they go over. Uh, that would be my feedback on that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I have one more solution for this situation. It is, uh, well, some of payment gateways support surname tokenization when they tokenize credit card data received during a transaction. And uh, they provide uh, some sort of API for uh, integrated payment models or shopping carts that led merchants to, uh, you know, make uh, repeat or new charges on a uh, customer's credit card stored that in PCI compliant environment of a payment gateway. Absolutely. Yes, it's, Yes, yes. And uh, for example, uh, experiments we've just talked about just maybe a couple of minutes ago, it's new version 2.0 supports of this tokenization through some of the integrated payment gateways. And uh, what's more important, it's, it, 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 it doesn't just, you know, charge customers credit card. It creates an order on the card side. So it, it provides a uh, very good integration between shopping cart and payment model, which is experiments, and also payment gateway. So uh, tokenization can be another solution in this situation. Uh, Absolutely, yes. and, and I just want to address, address that, Alex. What you just described and what I described are actually the same thing. With most tokenizations, you can actually get in there manually in the gateway, kind of like virtual terminal, and you can also handle it at the cart level. And actually, the merchant could really implement both, and that would be the ideal world. They could go into the cart, or if they have them on the phone, there's just a whole bunch of good ways to do that. Yes, and we have one more question from Mike. So how do we need to set up if we want to charge a card through XCard, QuickBooks merchant account? and then pass the card down to QuickBooks for additional charges that may be incurred during the order? I think it's a similar question we've just addressed. I, th uh, I think so. I think so. Be and also, it sounds like it's a QuickBooks specific question. And I, because I'm familiar with their functionality, I wouldn't uh, know exactly how to address that one. 
Well, uh, I, I think I can tell a little bit about that because uh, QuickBooks, their, their head company called into it. They rolled out a new payment gateway. Mm -hmm. And uh, our new experiments version is integrated with that payment gateway. And it is going to support tokenization for their new payment gateway too. It, it, it's not supported right now, but it's going to be supported in the next experiments release. So uh, let me check for that for other questions if we have any. Uh, well, not now. So I think that's it for today. And David, thank you very much for your time and for information you just shared shared with us. It was my it pleasure, was Alex. Very yes, it was very great to, great to have you as a speaker in our today's webinar. And thank you very much. And Thank you, everyone who attended this webinar today. Can I add a note, I Alex, before, before everyone goes? I just want to mention, if anybody has any questions about their business later on or whatever, um, I don't. you can always contact me through merchantaccounts.ca. And it's, it's a very um, industry-specific type of thing. So if anyone has any questions at any time, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to help. OK, thank you very much, and bye-bye. Okay, thanks Alex. Bye now. Thanks everyone.